When I was five years old, on April 9th, 1945, Hitler invaded Little Denmark. I have many ways, names for Hitler. Most of them would not be appropriate to use in this room. Uh, I call him, though, the biggest bully I have ever experienced. Also, he's insane and many, many more. Typically Hitler style, he invaded Denmark and many other countries, even though he had signed a non-aggression pact with Denmark. Denmark surrendered the same day. There was no way they could keep up with the German war machine. And uh, surrendering the same day probably saved about thousands of lives. I was born and raised in the middle of the country, a town called Odense, or you may call it Odense. Copenhagen on the right uh, is the capital of Denmark. At that time, there were four and a half million Jewish people out of a total population of four and a half million, so only a very small percentage uh, compared to other countries like uh, Poland. During the first three and a half years, conditions were relatively normal. Relatively normal compared to Poland and other occupied countries. Next slide, please. As an example, King Christian X was able to continue his ride every morning. This is one of my favorite pictures. You'll see he's being greeted, saluted by two German soldiers, and he's not looking at them. He hated the Nazis. He was a big, big supporter of the Jewish people. There are a number of myths about him, one being that he wore the Star of David in support of the Jewish people. He did not, and when I tell people that, they're always very disappointed. But there was no reason for him to wear the Star of David because we didn't wear one when we were occupied in Denmark. A couple of reasons I will mention why conditions were relatively normal the first three and a half years. And I may add that in addition to the king continuing to rule, the Danish government continued to govern. And this was not in case, the case in most other occupied countries. One reason being, a very few of the Danish people were Jewish people. Hitler was busy on many fronts, didn't want to devote any more resources uh, to Denmark than he had to. Also, and something that I feel is very, very important, in Denmark, you're first of all a Dane. It doesn't matter what color skin, it doesn't matter whether you're a Lutheran, whether you're a Catholic, or whether you're a Jewish people. You're first of all a Dane, I remember one interview my mother made one year before uh, she passed away. It was, uh, it was by some young journalist and she was asked, did you feel Jewish in Denmark? And she always said, of course I, I, I'm Jewish, but I felt first of all like a Dane. We were totally integrated into uh, the society. Just as another example, if I may have the next slide, I think it's relatively normal. You can see I haven't changed very much since the summer of 42. Uh, could you go back to the map? Uh, thank you. But interestingly enough, and it's amazing, that that picture was taken a year before we were arrested. What, what, a, what a contrast. Unfortunately, those relatively normal conditions came to a halt in the fall of 43. At that time, many young people in their late teens, early 20s, primarily men, accelerated their resistance movement. They were sinking ships so the Nazis couldn't use them. Uh, they were bombing buildings, rails, bridges. In summary, they were making life difficult for the Nazis and that was their purpose. As a result, the commandant went to the Danish government and said, 
you have to uh, sentence the young people, the saboteurs, to death. And there was no way the Danish government, big believer in human rights, we have never had capital punishment in Denmark, and I don't think we'll ever have it, couldn't accept the ultimatum. They, uh, uh, they uh, resigned, and the Danish administration took over. That became the beginning of what we refer to as the final solution, the roundup of the Jewish people. But again, it was different in Denmark. A German diplomat leaked the word. Consequently, 7,000 or 95% of the Jewish population managed to escape to Sweden. You'll see Sweden on the east coast, you can just see it in pale blue. About 95% of the Jewish population lived around Copenhagen. And this was a very, very unusual occasion. The Danes got together as never before, and there were a lot of people standing by, of sta uh, bystanders during the Holocaust, but there were many, many Danes that were standing up, and I refer to them as upstanders. Oscar Schindler would be another example of an upstander. In Denmark, they managed to hide 7,000 Jewish people in their private homes, in cottages, in hospitals, in churches, and during a 14-day period, 7,000 Jewish people were able to escape to Sweden. This included most of my family since they all lived in the area of Copenhagen. Unfortunately, living in the middle of the country, and you have to appreciate communications were quite different in those days, and we had not been warned, and consequently, one early morning, October 2nd, it was Rosh Hashanah, Jewish New Year, two Gestapo officers pounded on our door. We lived on the third floor in an apartment. I had no idea why they came to our apartment. Why didn't they go next door or why didn't they go below? I was very well aware of the occupation. I would bicycle to and from school every day and I would see the Nazi officers, soldiers walking up and down the street and I would try to avoid them whenever I could. So I knew that we had been occupied, but I didn't understand why they came to our apartment. I didn't know I was Jewish. I had not been brought up in the Jewish faith. Both my parents were Jewish. My father had been brought up in the Jewish faith. My mother had not. And again, is it a crime to be Jewish? Is it a crime to be Catholic? Is it a crime to be Lutheran? Of course not, but only in the evil mind of Hitler and his people. We got about a little more than half an hour uh, to, to get uh, ready. My mother and I were able to go downstairs at the bakery and got some uh, bread and rolls uh, from the baker who we knew. They, uh, we packed our stuff and could you go forward a few seconds? One more, one more, one more. Thank you. We were transported in that wagon that you see on the left. We were assembled in the middle of town of a school, about 60 Jewish people assembled. Later on, we were transferred to the western part of Denmark. In the next slide, you'll see, I'm always interested when I talk to groups like this, how, how many people have been to the Skokie Holocaust Museum? Oh, that's wonderful, uh, that's great. You remember the box car, the rail car you saw? Some of you might even have been in it. You'll find that survivors like myself, we call it a cattle car, that's what it was. We spent the next three days and three nights in complete darkness, nowhere to sit, 
No food, other than the food we had brought ourselves, nothing to drink. It was completely dark. We had no idea where we would end up. I was eight years old. I was frightened. I'm sure the parents were equally frightened. Not in our cattle car, but I understand in other cattle cars, people committed suicide other, rather than ending up in a concentration camp. There were four children my age who we were able to lie down. The rest of the people alternating between sitting and standing. Can you imagine doing that for 84 hours? The atmosphere was very tense. The smell got worse and worse. We didn't have bathroom facilities. We had to use buckets in the corner. We made one stop, got some fresh air, some water, and we got back into the cattle car. And we arrived, as you can see on the next slide, we arrived in what was in Czechoslovakia. Today is the Czech Republic in Terzin, a distance of 550 miles and three very, very long days and nights. On the next slide, you'll see the train station to the left, and to the right, you'll see inmates walking into camp. As soon as we arrived, we had to empty our pockets. The guards examined our suitcases, and they took all our valuables, they took all our money, and as cruel as they were, every person arrested in their home had been encouraged to bring money and to bring valuable. We were separated in barracks, women, men, seniors and children in separate barracks. Somehow, my mother was able to convince the authorities that I should stay with her. And you can see on the next slide what I refer to as our home away from home. In the book, I call it 18 months in hell. We slept on bunk beds, wooden bunk beds. We had straw mattresses, very little straw. We were basically lying directly on the wood. There were lots of lice, there were lots of fleas. And in the morning, I didn't understand why, uh, what was happening since I was scratching myself from the fleas and the lice. I'm sure you all heard about slave labor and everybody in Terrasen. And Terrasen was a concentration camp. It was not an extermination camp like Auschwitz-Birkenau. Auschwitz-Birkenau was a concentration camp, but it was an extermination camp with gas chambers at the same time. I'm often asked, why don't I have a number tattooed on my arm? Most people think that all survivors did. Uh, it's only and only in quote the survivors from Auschwitz and Birkenau, and there were a total of a million and a half people uh, sent deported to that infamous camp. Talking about slave labor, everybody over 16 years old had to perform it. My father was an attorney. He was used to office work. He was used to working in the courthouse, litigation. Suddenly, in the beginning of the winter, he had to work in the street, digging ditches. It was getting colder. He wore an overcoat. A guard came over, took the overcoat off him. You don't work with an overcoat. He was physically abused, he was actually whipped based on witnesses that I heard talk about it. And that was basically the way the Nazis acted when they didn't think that their inmates or their prisoners performed what they expected them to do. It was very, very hard for my father to do this kind of work since he wasn't used to it getting very little food, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. He lost about 50% of his body weight. 
He was transferred to an infirmary. He spent several weeks there. They had wonderful doctors, but they didn't have the tools. They didn't have the medical supplies. And he passed away of starvation, malnutrition. You can imagine the Nazis were not going to put on the death certificate that he died of uh, starvation. They listed it as pneumonia. My mother also worked. She had to. To my knowledge, she was not physically abused, but she was mentally abused on a number of occasions. Somehow, the Nazis seemed to be expert and terrorizing and dehumanizing the Jewish inmates in camp. I should add that every person in races that was Jewish, or they, they, they were all uh, Jewish, there was a separate fortress for political prisoners. So one day, my mother worked in a factory with several hundred other women. They were splitting a mineral called mica into thin layers and it was later used as insulation material for war machines, and they worked long hours. And an officer came in and asked my mother how she was feeling, and she said, not very well. I just lost my husband. And the officer asked, how did you lose your husband? He died of starvation. She told me later, when we got together in the barrack, and all the women from the floor circled around her afterwards and said, you shouldn't have said that. Uh, they could have done bad things to you, whatever that means. You can imagine that yourself. And my mother said, I was telling the truth. So she set an example, terrorized the people, the inmates. That same officer came back for seven consecutive days. And now my mother had to say he died of pneumonia. There are other examples, but I want to move. I want to move ahead. Talk a little bit about what I, as an eight-year-old boy, did. I was a messenger, and you have to appreciate the communications were so different in those days, without computers, without smartphones, and my job was to carry some messages and documents from one Nazi office to the other. I did that for a couple of hours in the morning, a couple of hours in the afternoon. On my way, I would pass the kitchen, and at the end of the kitchen, there were big sacks of raw potatoes. I would help myself, put a potato, raw potato in each pocket, and share them with my mother. Technically, I guess it was stealing, but it's a way of making another day. And I did that on a number of occasions. When I tell you about the meager food rations we got, you'll understand why we need all the help we can get. At breakfast, we would get substitute coffee with some brown bread. And on the next slide, you'll see what happened at lunch. I refer to it as a soup kitchen, and you'll see the people lining up. We would line up for about half an hour or more. We had our bowl, we had our wooden spoon. More days than none, it was what they referred to as potato soup. I don't know how they could call it potato soup because they ate the potatoes themselves, and we got the, only the potato peel. So it was basically boiled water with potato peel, and sometimes caraway soup, and for dinner, same menu. Sometimes, maybe once a week, we would get a special pasta dish uh, called, a special uh, German pasta dish called dumplings. So how were we able to exist on those rations? Many people, in addition to my father, were not able to do that. There were 140,000 out of 140,000 inmates, 40,000 passed away from starvation, illnesses like, uh, like typhus. Fortunately, after six months, and that probably saved a number of us, 
We started getting packages from Denmark and Sweden, packages consisting of food, vitamins, and clothing. The Danes probably got more packages than any other nation because of tremendous support for the Jewish people back in Denmark and Sweden. Sweden being a neutral country throughout the Holocaust. Of course, you won't be surprised when I tell you that uh, many of the packages didn't reach us. One day my mother was unpacking a very heavy package, couldn't understand what was in it since it was so heavy. She was absolutely shocked and angry when she found all the food, vitamin clothing had been taken by the guards and had left three bricks in the package. That's why it was so heavy. How can anybody be this cruel, treating human beings that way? I'll never, I'll never, never understand. I want to tell you about another example in camp. Uh, I was a, a growing boy and I needed new shoes. So my mother had to negotiate barter with a nice Czech lady. She got some new shoes and the lady from Czechoslovakia uh, got some Danish butter. That's the way you had to do it. I didn't realize at the time, but much later, I was told you could get just about anything for food. Next one, please. I played soccer on the gravel field with some Czech boys, became, became friendly. One day the boys didn't show up and I was very sad and I couldn't understand what had happened to them. I told my mother about it, she said, oh, I'm sure they'll be back in a few days, they may be ill. She knew exactly what had happened, wanted to shield the information from her nine-year-old boy. They were deported to extermination camps like Auschwitz-Birkenau. Here's an illustration of a cattle car with a Gestapo officer on the right, and you can see uh, how they literally shoveled into the cattle car. A total of nine, close to 90,000 inmates were sent to Auschwitz from Terrasen. I want to cover the next slide very, very briefly. I went back to Terrasen in 2009 to see it for myself as a free person and also research for my book. And I was moved and amazed when I saw my name on line four with my birthday on it. They had at the museum, which was located exactly where the children's barracks used to be, they had engraved the names of 15,000 children that passed through Terrasen. They were engraved in the wall, they were engraved on the sides, and less than 10% of us, less than 10% of 15,000 managed to uh, uh, escape survive. Very, very moving. I want to move forward and I, I want to skip the next few slides because uh, I, I want to make sure we get time uh, for some questions. So uh, move forward please. And I want to go forward to what I refer to as happy times. Happy times occurred on April the 15th when we were liberated by the Red Cross buses from uh, Sweden. See the flags on all the sides, the Red Cross. We couldn't believe it until the buses arrived. It was a miracle because the war was still going on. On the next slide, you see the welcome we got in Denmark. We could not stay in Denmark because uh, Denmark was still occupied. You wouldn't know it from this kind of welcome. Again, very, very unique. You would not get that kind of welcome in, uh, in Poland, as an example. We moved from Denmark to Sweden. We were quarantined for about a week. They wanted to make sure we didn't bring any illnesses into the country. About a week later, this is a Danish flag. 
It was flying everywhere on May the 5th, 1945, celebrating the surrender of the Nazis after five long years. My mother and I returned to Denmark to our hometown a few, uh, I think maybe a week or two weeks later, forever grateful to General Eisenhower and the Allies invading Normandy. If they hadn't done that, I cannot imagine what would happen to the world. I was able to go back to my old school, my old class. I got some private lessons. There was no official schooling in any camps. I graduated from high school some years later and uh, from commercial college a few years later. I joined a Danish food company and uh, I worked with them, for them in England, Canada. I've been in the United States since 1962. That was the year Eileen and I got, got married. And I retired in 99. And now, for the last four years, it's been not just my mission, but my passion to talk to students like yourself. And it's just amazing when I look out and I see your eyes following me and you're engaged, you're so respectful and you're so attentive and I appreciate that very much. If that wasn't the case, I wouldn't be able to do this. I call it my second career in education and I talked to about 28,000 mostly students over the last four and a half years and if you multiply that by four, as well over 100,000. And, and that's, uh, hopefully, I can continue to do it for a number of years, let me put it that way. On my last slide, this is my uh, website. You're all welcome to go on my website, ask any questions you have, and I'll answer them all. And maybe th this would be a good time. I can go on and on, but uh, I hope you will have questions so we can cover uh, what you want to talk about. I realize it's always a little difficult to get started, but as far as I'm concerned, uh, they're all good uh, questions. Who, who wants to start? Yes. So, uh, who, uh, so Mr. Matson would love to answer some questions. Who uh, has the mic? in the middle, I think. Kind of got to raise your hand. <laughs> how it works. We're all in school. We know how this works. Oh, sorry, I'll go back here. If there's one message you could give to the world about your experience and what we could take from it, what would that be? Thank you very much for, for asking this excellent question. Uh, to me, there's more than one message. One message would be that you can be successful even though you're going through some difficult times. I'm not advocating that anybody here should go through a time like I did, but sometime in your life you're going to have some difficult times and you can still be successful. I believe I've been successful on two important fronts, from a family point of view, and also from a business point of view in, in, in business. That comes out loud and clear. When anybody, if you ever see anybody being bullied, I hope you will be an upstander and not a bystander. And if you cannot handle it yourself, uh, talk to a teacher. I consider that very important. And you want to treat other people the way you want to tr be treated your, uh, yourself and you want to respect other people. So it's the direct opposite, as far as I'm concerned, to the way Hitler uh, treated the Jewish people. And that was a long way of answering your question. Anybody else? Uh, what kept your hopes up during your time in the camp to uh, have faith in yourself and uh, know that you're gonna get through it? 
how, how did we manage to keep up hope? Is that your question? It was very, very difficult. As an eight or nine year old, I don't know that you think along those lines, but I remember, and I'm very fortunate, my mother was interviewed a year before uh, she passed away. And she said in the interview, we never gave up hope. I uh, couldn't afford to give up hope, especially not when I, when I had an eight or nine year old. You just had to hope for the best would happen. And I, I have to tell you in all honesty, and I apologize to Father Corey uh, for mentioning this, but I have to tell you exactly how the survivors felt about it. And we often wondered, where was God? Why did God do this to us? And uh, this may not be the right atmosphere to talk about it, but this is how we felt. Some of you have read Knight Elie Wiesel, and he says the same thing. I read in a book about a, a, a survivor the other day, and that was brand new to me. Uh, he, he said, maybe God was on vacation. Thank you. Want to go to the next? I want to thank you for that comment, Mr. Metz. And can I ask you to talk a little bit about how you have struggled with that? When you look now, many years back, um, Thank how does you. that affect your image of God? Thank you very much. It was especially difficult, and again, keeping in mind that I was eight or nine years old, uh, but it, it was especially difficult right after the war, especially without my father. And, w w you know, why did I have to lose my father? I realized there were six million others, but what, what, you know, you always ask your question, why did it have to be me? Right after the war, we wanted to get as far away as we could from the Jewish faith, quite frankly. And this may not be the right thing to talk about either, but that's a fact. Because the only reason that six million uh, people passed, they happened to be born Jewish. And uh, I remember, as a smart 10-year-old boy, I said to my mother uh, right afterwards, um, if this happens again, let's make sure we, we escape this time. I, if my father had survived, I'm quite sure I would have been raised in the Jewish faith, but uh, my mother, I wasn't with my mother, and I do not observe uh, the, the Jewish faith. I, 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 I never have. I have one granddaughter here, Sarah, who helps me with, with the slides, and another daughter in, uh, in the Catholic school. But I'll add this, over the last four years, when I talk to so many people, being part of a Holocaust uh, Remembrance Day a couple of weeks ago, I feel more Jewish, I feel I identify more uh, with the Jewish people. And I think that's the best way. And thank you very much, fellow, for asking that question. Thank you. Mr. Metz, thank you very much. About a round of applause for, thank you for spending your time today. Just one thing, if I may. Thank you again for being so attentive, and please don't forget your homework. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um